Um, welcome to the Strand Bookstore. We are 85 years old as of this year, just a couple of months ago, and still independent. And uh, no, uh, I am not related to the Bass family that owns the bookstore. Um, so afterwards, you can ask me about the history, but I am not a relation. Tonight, we are very, very pleased to welcome um, through Book Expo, or BEA, and through Penguin Books, this wonderful panel that's going to be here this evening. And so um, the moderator this evening is, is uh, Laura Purchisepe from Riverhead Books, and I will let her do the introduction uh, for this panel, and you will learn about publishing, the perils of publishing, and the triumphs, I hope. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thanks for everybody for being here. We're excited to talk to you all. So I'm just going to introduce everybody briefly, and then we'll sort of go into our discussion. Um, David Gillum is, was trained as a writer at the University of Southern California, and he moved from screenwriting into fiction. And then after relocating to New York, he spent over a decade in the book business. And The City of Women, City of Women is his first book, and it's coming out this August from Amy Einhorn Books. It's beautiful. Um, Amy Einhorn is his editor, who's right next to him. And she's been in publishing for over 20 years. She started her career at Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. And then she launched her eponymous imprint, Amy Einhorn Books, in 2009. And her first novel, you guys might have heard of it, um, was published then. And it's called The Help by Catherine Stockett. And it sold over 10 million copies. And other books that she's published there um, include New York Times bestsellers, The Postmistress by Sarah Blake, The Weird Sisters by Eleanor Brown, The Book of Awesome by Neil Pasrika, and last month's number one New York Times bestseller, The Memoir, Let's Pretend This Never Happened by Jenny Lawson, which is really funny. You guys should all check it out. And Julie Bear is our agent friend in the middle. Um, Julie established her own agency in 2004 after six years at Sanford Greedberger. And her clients include National Book Award finalist Joshua Ferris, best-selling novelist Paula McLean, Kevin Wilson, and Helen Simonson. Writing by her clients have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Best American Non-Required Reading, News Stories from the South, Tin House. Basically, there's like a huge list. They've appeared everywhere. <laughs> um, and before becoming an agent, she was a bookseller in New York, which is very exciting. Um, Anne Napolitano is our other writer, and she's the author of the novels A Good Hard Look, which is right here, also very beautiful, and Within Arm's Reach. A Good Hard Look was published in July 2011 and was an indie next pick, an okra pick, and spent several weeks on the Southern Independent bestseller list. And she lives in New York City. And Ginny, down at the end, Ginny smith -Yance, has, um is a senior editor at the Penguin Press, and she's worked with authors including Pamela Druckerman, Daniel Jurgen, Gary Marcus, Rana Dasgupta, and of course, Anne Napolitano. So those are our panelists, and I'm gonna start by just asking them a few questions, and then we'll go into Q&A with all of you guys, just to sort of get the discussion started. So my first question is for the authors, and I guess, Anne, I'll start with you, if you don't mind. Um, can you just give a quick history of your publication story, kind of, from writing to getting an agent to, you know, getting signed up by Penguin Press? Sure. Um, you can hear me. I mean, I'll preface this by saying that every writer I know has an entirely different story, so I can't say that mine's indicative of anything. Um, I wrote my first novel when I was at the MFA program at NYU, and once it was finished, I tried to get an agent, and it was rejected by 80 agents over the course of like a year. Um, I was working as a personal assistant at the time to support myself. And in my free time, again, obviously, I started writing another novel. It took about three years to write while working as a personal assistant. And um, when that was finished, I sent it out to agents again. And I had three agents that wanted to represent me um, based on the book, which was very happy making. And I met with all three of them and chose the one that I just felt the best about, uh, made the most sense. And she sent the book out, and it didn't sell. Um, there was one editor that wanted to buy it, but their boss was on maternity leave, and it just didn't happen. Um, so that was sad, obviously. And so I put that book in the drawer, too. And um, at, at that point, I was mostly depressed and trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, because it was, was not working very well, and I had never aspired to be a long-term personal assistant. 
um, as lovely as the job was. Um, so, but I realized that I had to, the only way to get out of the depression was to write. So I started writing a book that was like loosely based on my mother's family and I thought, no big deal, I don't get published anyway, so they'll never read it. <laughs> and uh, that book, of course, is the one that sold. Um, so that was Within Arms Reach, my first book. Um, and then I had made enough money to, for like three years to quit my personal assistant job and support myself writing. And I was like, great, I have this figured out. I'm going to write another book in three years. And then I'll have, you know, have to sell another one. And it'll be like this clean path. And it took me seven years to write a good hard look. So what I've learned is that there is no making a plan. Um, but a good hard look, um, obviously, I sold to Penguin Press and brought me to now. And David, do you mind sharing your story, too? Uh, sure. Um, can you hear me OK? My story, I was, uh, I got my MFA from USC, and I started out a screen, as a screenwriter, um, and um, I still, I value that, because when I do write, um, I write very cinematically. I still think I'm, I'm seeing the picture with people, and I'm, I'm hearing the dialogue. But um, I started out as a screenwriter, and then I met uh, a professor named Shelley Lowenkopf at USC, who's still around blogging, and he turned me into a novelist. Well. <laughs> he started me writing novels, let me put it that way, um, which I did and didn't publish the first one. Um, and I kept writing and uh, I didn't publish the second one. Uh, and then I kept writing and I almost published the third one. Um, and then the fourth one, I, um, let's see, that one was really just for my son. It was a kid's book, so I, I only tried a little not to publish it and succeeded. Um, and then uh, finally, the City of Women came along, um, and um, I, I was lucky enough to get that through. In the meantime, about 30 years had passed, so in some sense, I guess I'm the poster boy for, uh, for never quit, uh, just keep doing it. Um, I worked at all sorts of different jobs. I uh, was in the book business, I was in ho uh, retail, I sold books, I was in wholesale for 10 years. Uh, book wholesale, work for a distributor, I work for a publisher doing their catalogs. Um, I moved to Massachusetts um, where I was also a personal assistant and an executive assistant and um, I worked for a nonprofit and I did all these other little jobs but I was always still writing. Um, often, you know, start at 10 o'clock at night and end up 1.30 in the morning thinking, God, I'm, why did I stay up so late? But I just, you know, the, the time just went by. Um, so you just got to keep at it. Um, very quickly, I'll, I'll have a little dramatic story here where um, I had decided somewhere in this process that I was going to stop. You know, I, I, it was, um, I, I, I had been writing for a long time. I, I was sending out blanket uh, queries to uh, agents through the, back then, the IMP, that huge book that used to take out of the reference section on the library and copy all the names down on a, on a, on a pad. Um, and um, I, I said I'd had enough. You know, I, I wasn't focusing on my other career in, 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 uh, in the book business and that I, that I might as well just stop this. And that day, I got a response from the last batch of queries I had sent out, just as sort of a, a, a flare that I shot up into the air, um, saying, oh, you know, we'd really like to see the rest of this novel. And so you never know what's going to happen, I guess, is the message in that. It's a good message in the book business, I think. Um, so my next question is for Julie, and I think sort of going, going along in the stories that we just heard, sort of what do you look for when you get a query from an author, what do you look for in a new author? And these guys have both said how many times they've queried agents, and I know it sort of takes something to get something to stand out for an agent. I think it's hard because you spend um, so many years probably, you know, working, toiling away on this book and revising and polishing and editing, and then you finally get it to exactly where you want it to be, and you're ready to send it out. And then it's like, oh, God, now I have to write a query letter about it? And it's actually it's quite a challenge. But I think um, the practice of writing your query letter is, is, is actually a really valuable 
experience because it will give you um, some skills and some tools that you'll need to get through, I think, the publication process and your career, which is that you need to be able to speak clearly, succinctly, and, and in an engaging way um, about what your book is really about. If you can't, I mean, you know, sort of talk about the elevator pitch, like, if you can't catch me in an elevator or at a party or five minutes here afterwards and tell me in two to three sentences what the heart of your book is about, then you're not ready to start querying agents. And you're gonna need to do that for the rest of your career. So um, I always suggest that you go to a bookstore um, and you look at what we call, what we refer to as flap copy or jacket copy, which are the flaps um, on the side of a book or the back jacket copy. And, and look at those descriptions of those books and think about what it is in them that makes you want to buy the book. More often than not, it's because the publisher is giving you just enough information to get excited, but not so much detail about the story that you feel like you've already read it. So when I get a query letter and it goes on and on and it's like, boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets a dog, boy's sister gets in a car accident, but you know, on and on, it's like, and now I have read your book and I no longer need to request for a manuscript. Um, so less, less is more, and, and I think if you can think of a description that gives, us, gives me a taste of what your story is about, but doesn't go the full nine yards, then you'll leave me wanting more, which is exactly what we're trying to do when we get you in the bookstore. Um, and then the, the other guidelines that I suggest are really basic ones, which is that no bells and whistles, keep it simple, keep it professional. Please spell my name right. It goes actually quite a long way. And when I get called Mr. Barber, I immediately put that letter in the rejection pile. Um, and, 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 and I think, I mean, that sounds mean, but the fact is there's so much information out there online these days that it, it would take you five minutes to do this research. And if you don't take that five minutes, it shows me that you don't really care. And I am looking for clients who really care and who are really thoughtful about their work and presenting their work into the world because that's what we're going to need from you. Um, and I think that, you know, the sort of, the, the like, my book is going to be the next Oprah pick or my book is, you know, going to be at the top of the bestseller list. Like, I don't want to, you, you don't know that. <laughs> I know that maybe, but you don't. And I don't even know that. Um, I want I want to hear what the book is about and what you have to bring to the table maybe personally as an author, but I don't need you to tell me how rich and successful you're gonna make me. Because um, again, that just immediately turns me off. Um, I will say my own encouraging story from this week about query letters and the slush pile, which is that um, pile of, used to actually be a, a pile of paper, now it's a pile in my inbox, <laughs> in my um, electronic inbox, of queries that come in with no no connection to me. So it's not through another client. It's not through a writing program I visited. It's just, dear Ms. Bear, I have written a novel. Um, it is the story of XYZ. Um, two years ago, I got a query from a woman who had spent the last 10 years working on a novel. She had no formal training. She didn't come from an MFA program. She hadn't studied creative writing. She taught junior high boys um, outside of Boston. She taught classics. And she had written a novel about the legend of Achilles and his love affair with Patroclus. And um, we sold the book, and it got wonderful reviews. And last week, it won the Orange Prize. And she came out of nowhere, and I found her in the slush pile, and she's, she's one of many authors that I represent who come out of nowhere. So I, I do think there's this feeling when you're writing your query letters, like, who's going to pay attention to my random query letter? I'm not, you know, the son of somebody famous, or I didn't go to some fancy school. That's not true. We're, we're looking for great stories, and that is the thing that matters to us the most. Thanks. Um, so the next question is for Amy and Jenny. Um, so. Julie has this great proposal that she's pulled from the slush and she sends it to you guys. And what do you look for in a proposal? And what kind of stands out for you in a great proposal or a great manuscript that you get in? Okay, now, now, oh, that's very good. <laughs> um, I think Julie just demonstrated to you the first step, which is our business is a business of passionate people. And that's why 
we still believe that publishing requires people. It requires people who are great readers, who are great lovers of words, uh, and who know and treasure talented authors. And when you hear Julie, as you just did, speak about a novel or a project that she believes in, it's very compelling. She's very good at her job. So that's that's the first step, is, is hearing from the agent what it is that they're excited about. And the really great thing about the business is we're a fairly small community, and we know people, we know their lists, we know their tastes over time, so I know what it means to hear something that she's excited about. So that's that's why it's important to have, to have representation and to have someone go out there and go to bat for you and and do your do your book proud and do your work proud. Um, I work for an imprint called the Penguin Press. We publish a lot of narrative nonfiction. So I think one of the things that we're looking for, particularly in a proposal, is uh, something that that speaks to to a question that's that's in the consciousness that that's out there in the zeitgeist. And it's an unusual response to that question. It's a thoughtful response. It's someone who has walked a long journey in a particular path, and we have a lot to gain from their wisdom. So I think I think that, uh, for in a very general way, is is something of what makes nonfiction work in this particular market. If you have uh, the pleasure of reading Anne's novel, A Good Hard Look, which comes out in paperback next month, so you can avail yourself of the hardcover. And you e should all the buy paperback. a copy. Thank you, Julie. Um, you'll get a sense that you're walking with Flannery O'Connor, which is a truly amazing treat. And I have been scared of her work for as long as I can remember. And Anne made me fall in love with her and made me see a place actually that I'm from in a new way and in a profoundly special way. So I think particularly with fiction, uh, you just have to be in the hands of a master and that, that is what you will be when you read Anne's novel. No? Here, do you want to use it? Yeah. <laughs> can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. now everyone can hear me. Um, <laughs> I think it's a very hard question because I've, I've found, um, I'm going to sort of circle to all of the questions. I think I've found that authors sometimes are the worst people to talk about their books at the beginning of the process. Um, Catherine Stockett, who wrote The Help, was rejected by 60 agents. And I remember once we bought the book, she was saying to me, you know, when I talk about the book at the club, people kind of roll their eyes and no one seems to want to, is interested. And I said, well, what do you say? And she started to tell me what she said. And I said, I wouldn't want to read that book either. <laughs> um, so I think that that's hard. I think that if you have a good agent, I think then they'll write a really great pitch letter, which is going to make me want to read it. And, and as Ginny said, there are certain agents where just by reputation, if Julie sends something out, everyone's looking at it, while somebody else who sort of throws up a lot of books, you know, spaghetti against the wall, you're not rushing to read it as much. Um, I think some of it's gut. Um, I used to work for a woman who, um, when I was an assistant in the publishing process, moving up, it's very much sort of, you're a mentor, you're, a men you're, you're mentored. And the woman I worked for, um, used to read the first sentence of the manuscript, and this is back when everything was a physical submission, and if she didn't like the first sentence, she would put it back and just say, you read it. Um, and, and I'm not that bad, but I will say, I do usually, when I get a submission in, I read the first page, and, and this is for fiction. And that's not to say that something can't surprise me, but my feeling is is that if, you're, if, if you can't give me a good opening, that doesn't bode well. Um, and that doesn't mean that the first sentence has to be the best first sentence, but if you can't get me on that first page, then then that gives me pause. Um, but again, I also think that a lot of it's voice, which is very hard to describe. And I think some agents are quite good at being able to distill it, and some agents are not. OK, so back to um, David and Anne. So both of you write about historical time periods. And I just sort of wanted to know, how much research did you do I think a lot of people want to know this before you submitted your manuscript, or did you have a finished manuscript, and then also um, when you submitted, and then also did you have a writer's group, or who was the first person to read your book, and was that person your agent, or was that person somebody else in your life? Sure. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, I did. I did. Uh, as far as research, I. Um, I didn't intend to write a book about Flannery O'Connor. I was writing a novel about another character for about a year, and it just wasn't working. And I'm not a revelatory type person, but it's a longer story. But there was a day where I was going to put the manuscript down and say it just wasn't working, and I was going to start something new. And I was looking at my bookshelf, and I saw 
uh, The Habit of Being, which is the collection of Flannery O'Connor's letters, which is wonderful, which everyone should read if they haven't. Um, and the thought occurred to me that Flannery O'Connor belonged in the novel, um, which was like, an, I'm from New Jersey, writing about a Southern literary icon is like insanity and stupid, and I, I fought the idea for quite some time. Um, but once I accepted it, I probably researched, there's not a lot to read actually on Flannery O'Connor, um, but obviously I went to Andalusia, I went to her home in Georgia, I read everything I could, um, I did as much research as I could, and then I tried to forget it um, and not look at it because it's very difficult to create something that is real and alive while being chained to the facts. So I tried to create her um, without looking at my notes which was hard, because I kept wanting to look at my notes. Um, and then at the end, I went back and double-checked and made sure I hadn't made any gross inaccuracies. And on the whole, I really hadn't, um, just because you ingrained it at that point. And like I said, it took me seven years to write, so there was a lot of, it took seven years to write because I had to create Flannery O'Connor, and that was like an insane thing to do that I had to figure out how to do, and I had to like, be my own MFA program. Like, I just wasn't ready when I started, and I had to become capable of that. Um, Oh, and I had a finished manuscript when I was done. I've never done otherwise up to this point in my career. Um, I feel very anal, like I feel very anal. I am very, <laughs> I'm very controlling um, of my work. Um, and in answer to the second part of it, I do have a writer's group and they are the, up until now, again, they are the only people who have seen my work until I give it to my agent. Um, and it's two writers that I went to MFA program with, um, Hannah Tinty and Helen Ellis. and I dedicated my book to them. Um, and the, for the three of us, we've now been meeting about once a week for 16 years, and we are the first eyes that um, read each other's work, and we are very hard on each other and very loving at the same time. Um, they're kind of like the most important relationship in my life outside of my family. Um, so yes, so I think that answers all of that. Yeah, great. <laughs> David, what about you? Um, let's see, can you hear me still? Okay, good. Um, Oh, yeah, sorry, it's like multi-part, um, not to confuse all of you guys. Um, finished manuscript and all the research oh, that you guys had to do for your books, and then who read your book first? Okay. Well, one of the advantages of writing for so long before I get published is that I was sort of basically writing the same book over and over again, I think. Um, different versions of it, different characters, but I did a lot of, the, this book takes place in Berlin during the Second World War, at the height of the Second World War. So I did a lot of research over the years about Berlin. So by the time I actually got to this, I knew it pretty well. Um, books, um, all kinds of books, other novels, I went there. Um, I, I found it all invaluable, but one of the things you have to, to worry about, uh, well, I won't say worry, but you have to watch when you're writing, um, fiction that's based in history, not to let the history get in the way too much. Uh, somebody who's a master about this is Alan First. He can weave that uh, detail right into the story so you don't even realize that you're, um, that you're learning things, that you're being shown that he's building this world around you without you, without you even noticing it. Because character is very important to him. And, and I think that above all, you can't sacrifice your character or your story to the detail. Um, so, I mean, I, and I still do, do, um, am doing research for this book, even though it's now um, uh, going to print. You know, I, I'll be reading something and say, oh, I'd like to put that in that, and then I realize it's too late. I can't put it in, in there anymore. It's, it's already on its way. Um, and uh, the second uh, question was the writing group. Myself, um, I've been in many writing groups over the years. I enjoy them, but they're really sort of entertainment for me. Um, I, if I stick in a writing group too long, I start to get too many voices in my head, and I start real realizing that I'm responding to what I anticipate the other people in the writing group are going to say. Uh, that's just me, though. Some people have a, a great time with, with a group and, and really... Um, um, take a lot away from it. I always enjoyed it, but um, I do have uh, one person who I go to um, who runs a writing group that I'm not a part of, uh, but she um, was great at, you know, helping me solve problems and sounding things out and using, working as a sounding board um, during the time that I was creating the book. So I, I think it is very valuable to have somebody because, you know, you're writing, sometimes it feels like 
you spend so much time in the area between your ears that um, you have no perspective on this book any longer. You can't tell what's happening. And so it is really valuable to have somebody, I think, who you trust, you can go to and ask the questions that you're wondering about, who's going to be honest with you without being brutal, uh, because it's a very fragile process. You know, you show it to somebody at the wrong time and they say, oh, hmm, no, that wasn't quite, uh, um, that wasn't quite too interesting. And immediately it's like, okay, well, I'll just throw the whole thing away and, uh, and that'll be it. So, you know, be good to yourself, but also find somebody who you can trust and, and, and talk to it about. Great. Um, next question is for Julie. Uh, where do you look for writers when you go out and kind of look around? And what publications do you read? And where do you look for people? And do you get a lot of referrals? How do you get I, clients? I do get a lot of referrals. Um, I, I, you know, besides looking in the slush pile, which I think is a really important place to find exciting and interesting new voices, um, I. I get a lot of referrals from clients that I already represent who either went to an MFA program with a, a, a friend or is in a writing group with a friend or, you know, met somebody in a coffee shop and things, you know, they might have a good book. Um, and, I, and I do always sort of try and, um, especially if they've read that person's work and really like it, pay close attention to that. Um, I'm friends with a lot of MFA or writing program and writing conference, summer writing conferences or um, various winter ones too, people who run those programs and so they'll often point people to me and say, this person came to the conference. I go to, I used to go to a lot, I go, I go to less now, um, but I go often to Breadloaf, which is in Vermont, which I think is one of the best writing workshop conferences out there. Um, another one I love is the Squaw Valley Writers Conference which is in Squaw Valley in California, and uh, Nevada. Um, Grub Street has a great one in Boston. There's a lot of really great ones. I mean, One Story, which is a literary magazine that I love, that I'm on the board of, that I subscribe to, and that I look at the minute it lands on my desk because they send, it's a great, it's a great idea. It's one, just one story every four weeks. And, um, and you just know, like, the minute it lands on your desk, it's land on, on every other agent in town's desk as well. And they're all reading it that night, and they're all going to try and find out if that writer is representation. So, because it's always that good. Um, I love, I mean, obviously, there, there are magazines I love to read fiction in, such as The New Yorker, but I don't really look for clients in those magazines. I look to The Suwannee Review or um, Glimmer Train or The Cincinnati Review. And there, I mean, there's so many amazing um, Tin House and, and One Story and Zoetrope and lots of really great small ones too, like especially that come out of colleges in the South. And if you go to Poets and Writers website, and that's an, an amazing magazine that you should definitely subscribe to if you're, if you're looking to be a published writer because there's a wealth of information in it. Um, they have a great list of magazines uh, writing you know, journals and websites. And I, I also say, it's not just a great place for agents to discover your work, it's a great place for you to experience being edited. Um, and some of these literary journals have really amazing guest editors. I, I mean, I found a client who was, I think it was Prairie Schooner, or I can't remember where, but was being edited by Jim Shepard. And it was like, she's an un, you know, never had a book published, one of her first short stories. She gets to be edited by Jim Shepard, who I think is one of our best contemporary fiction writers right now. So it's a great experience for you to have, regardless of looking for an agent, I think. Great. And also, you can probably buy a lot of those magazines at the Strand. Indeed, you can. They're probably downstairs. Um, so Amy and Jenny, uh, what can authors do besides write their book? to kind of appeal to a publisher and to stand out to you guys? You know, is it social media? Is it being the expert in what they're writing about? What are sort of those elements that you guys really look for? I, I'm gonna answer for nonfiction because I think that's easier. Nonfiction, it matters more if you have a platform, what we'll call a platform. Um, so in terms of if you have Twitter followers or Facebook followers, all of that. If for fiction, I don't think you really need any of that. I mean, most of the people I publish in fiction, no one had heard of before I published them. Um, they came with, some of them didn't even have any of the social media. Um, I, I, 
I'm thinking of, I'm missing anything in that respect, but I don't think so. Drop, drop my basket there. Um, I think it's, it's circling back to what Julie was saying in the very beginning. It's being able to explain to us exactly what you're going to bring, because publishing really is a partnership. So how you've thought about your publication, the this is, again, particular to nonfiction, uh, the particular audience that you can reach, what sort of inroads you have, what re existing relationships or institutions that you have relationships with are going to aid this publication. Because it is, um, this is BEA week. If you had the opportunity to go to the Javits Center, you know that there are an awful lot of books that are published into the ether, and most of them disappear. So if you can help us identify your first core group of readers, that's enormously helpful. Great. Um, okay, so I think this is going to be our final question, then we're going to open it up to Q&A. But I just wanted to ask Anne and David, um, what sort of surprised you about the publishing process? And what kind of, you know, things that came up that you would never have expected to come up, came up? It took me so long to get published that I, <laughs> Nothing surprises know. you anymore. It, yeah, it was a surprise <laughs> to get published. <laughs> Pub being published was a surprise. Everyone's very nice. I mean, I've in general found people to be very nice, um, and they're book lovers. Um, actually, part of Twitter that I, I reluctantly went on to social media with the publication of A Good Hard Luck. It didn't exist for my first novel. I mean, Twitter didn't certainly. Um, that there's like a real book loving community and hunger out there that you can connect into, which I was genuinely surprised by, um, and. Obviously, pleasurably so. Um, I don't, there's been like little quirky things, like with my first book, like the um, my it sold in England as well, and the um, English editor wanted me to publish under a different name because it would fit my Wait, different it, title or different. No, my, your name was different. Name different. Oh, because uh, it was called Within Arms Reach, and it was about my mother's big Irish Catholic family. My mother's maiden name is McNamara. But my last name is Naplatano, which is obviously not Irish. So she wanted me to publish under Anne McNamara, which would be, which is actually my grandmother's name. Um, so that it would be like, people would be like, oh, it makes sense, because she, but I'm like, it's fiction. <laughs> I don't even have to have been Irish, you know, in background to have written this book. I just happen to have been. Um, so like, you know, there are some strange things that are thrown at you, I think. But, and the larger picture, getting published was a surprise. Well, uh, surprises. Looking back, I was surprised that it did take a long time. Um, but um, since it actually is, is sort of coming to fruition now, uh, what has surprised me, and, and just as Anne was saying, is it's been quite a, a, a great experience. Uh, everyone's been great. You know, I, I, I owe a lot to, uh, to my agent, Rebecca Gradinger, back there. A woman right here beside me uh, for helping me form that book, um, and you know, again, that goes back to what I was saying early. Take help from people who, who you trust. Um, I suppose one of the big surprises is not so much in publishing, but once the book is out there and people are starting to read it, like they are in the galley, you find out what your book is actually about, uh, because you think it's about one thing, but then you find, no, it's actually about other things because everybody's going to have a slightly different reaction to it. So I think that's probably the, the, the top surprise um, uh, that uh, you start to define what your, your book is truly about after it leaves your hands. Um, and again, uh, what was being said earlier, I'm, I, I, I hated having to describe what the novel was about. Synopsis, oh God, they were just terrible. Just grueling to write, but you got to learn how to pare it down and give out the essential information so it still works for people and still grabs their attention. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. A lot of words of wisdom. Um, so now I'm going to open it up to questions, and if anybody wants to go first, yeah. How important is it? So the question was, how important is it to, um, if you're looking at a novel published, to start with short stories and to get those published? And is that a prerequisite to getting an agent and getting a publisher? Um, it's not important at all. I mean, I, I think if you are a gifted short story writer, 
um, then by all means, exploit that gift and, and send out short stories and you will attract a lot of agents and, and if you get published in some good publications, it will certainly help me attract publishers' interest, but, um, but it's not a prerequisite and I think a lot of writers can spend a lot of wasted time on, a, on the short form when it, just because you're a good fiction writer doesn't mean you're a good short story writer. Um, I have a lot of incredibly talented clients who've written wonderful novels who just are not short story writers. And likewise, I think there are short story writers who aren't novelists. Um, they're not, they don't go hand in hand and you don't need to have one to have the other. And, well, I'll say that it's a lot harder as a short story writer to get a book deal if you don't have a novel planned. Um, but, but publishers, unless I'm speaking out of turn, don't really count. I would say, in fact, like being a short story writer is so, like that skill set is very different from being a novelist. So it's not always something that goes naturally hand in hand, as Julie's saying. All these stories that we hear about Chicken Soup for the Soul, 135 rejections, Harry Potter, a dozen rejections, rejections of one of these fine writers have had. I just want to get your sense of why that is. I'm told that they sent out 22 classes and had one pillagers and the rest and name off and one asked for a little bit more and the rest were all rejected. So <laughs> why, do you, why do you think that is? So, I mean, I realize you guys are swamped and you're enormous enough and that you have your own interests and you publish only so many books. But I'm just always been curious about that. <laughs> no, I mean, and I think people love to hear about, you know, I think it was, wasn't it John Grisham? He was rejected. He was so, I mean, there's, oh, yeah, there's a ton of stories like that. I think that I'd be curious if you went back and looked at who they sent to, if they were doing sort of really blind query letters that ended up with the receptionist who goes through the slush or if they ended up being read. When I started at FSG, we would have a slush party once a month. And I remember we had, back then it was really fancy because we got to have pizza. And we would, all the assistants would get together and Rick Moody, who was then the associate editor or managing editor, was in charge. And I remember I started to read the letter and he said, oh, no, 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 you don't read the letter. Like, I mean, you just didn't have time. So I think there's certain places, like Julie obviously has, has made, a, has been wonderful about mining the slush pile. I think that other places, I will say after 9-11, we stopped in my former company um, really taking slush, because um, this was still when people were sending stuff physically. Um, and I do think that there's something to be said about, you know, people think, some people think they're writers because they can write a sentence, and so we get a ton of submissions. Um, I am not of the belief that the great American novel is, is lying somewhere and not being published. I think that if you are serious and you have a good book, that it will see the light of day. But obviously, I'm defending publishers, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't attacking no, no, no. no, no, no. I would say, too, that the first two books that I wrote that didn't get published were not good enough. I mean, the first book, definitely, I was learning how to write a novel. I think there was one good scene in it. Um, and I've never read it again, but I never <laughs> think there was one good scene. And then the second book, I think, was, I try, I, each time after I finish a book, I go back and read that because I'm like, wouldn't it be nice if I spent six months rewriting this book and, you know, be done with another one. But I just can't get past the second chapter. I don't, it's, it's better than the first one, but I would say it took me three books before I was writing a good book. But I think, I think it's also important to remember that, especially when it comes to fiction, fiction is enormously subjective. And it, it's really, it is extremely personal. I mean, you sort of listed that in the category, but actually, I would say that it's at the top of the category of why I respond to something and why these folks respond to something. So it's almost like I don't think to have to go through 30 or 60 or however many agents it takes is a bad thing because as long as you find the one <coughs> right person, and that's what we say all the time, all it takes is one. And sometimes there's just one really right person. And, 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 I, and there's so many books that I, that I have personally passed on, that have come out and gone on to be hugely successful, and even though I feel bitter and angry and look at my bank account all the time when they're successful, um, I also realize, like, you know what? I, I was not the right person for that book. I didn't love it. I didn't see it. Doesn't mean it's not a great book. It just means 
I wouldn't have been the best advocate for it. And so I think, I think you know, what Amy said, in part, taking that a step further, doing your research and really looking at, you know, I have a list on my website of the kinds of books I don't represent. You know, sports, military, um, self-help. And I'm amazed at how many people still query me with those books. And it's like, you know, trying to send your book, trying to do some research and thinking like, I would, I would say that my book would appeal to readers of that book. Well, who represented that book? Um, not exactly the same. I mean, I represented a novel called Then We Came to the End by a writer named Josh Ferris, and it took place um, in the advertising world um, during the not most recent, but the last economic crash. And I was amazed after it came out at how many office novels I got. And I thought, um, okay, I, I, I'm not, probably not going to do another one. Like, it's not going to get better than that one. And I've done that. I'm looking for something new. So, not, you know, but if you, if you can say, like, I write in the vein of this person, or I think that my style of, a sense of humor is similar, then you're narrowing the field a little bit, and that can sometimes really help your chances. Can I just say the simplest piece of advice that elaborate on what Julie just said, is look at the acknowledgments of books that you feel like your book is working in the same vein as. Everyone will always thank, or should always thank, their agent, uh, and, and usually their editor as well. So you can begin to get a sense of, okay, this is, this is who this is. Start to pay attention to imprints. It means a lot to us, sadly, very little to the rest of the world. Um, and also, Google is your friend. And uh, there's a site called Publishers Marketplace for which, for a small fee, you can have a subscription to and then see all the deal listings. So you can see all of the agents who are selling the type of work that, that you're doing. And Julie can correct me if I'm wrong, but the one thing I will say is I do think that people sort of will look at, oh, and they'll take someone like John Grisham. You know what, John Grisham's agent doesn't need to take on a lot of other people right now. So going to somebody who represents John Grisham is probably not gonna be your best bet. But the fact is there's probably someone young and hungry in his office who is looking to take on somebody, so go to them. And the only other thing I'd add, and Julie kind of touched on this, but to me, one of the most, like, drives me nuts, don't tell me that you're gonna go to all these people for quotes, because you know what? Unless you know them, it's meaningless. It's like saying, and I'm gonna try and get myself on Oprah. Like, I can go yeah. to these people for quotes, but you'd be amazed how many people will tell, like, in their proposal, which bad agents would then pass on to us, because <laughs> Julie would never do this. Well, they'll say, and I'm gonna solicit, and then they'll go through all these people, half of whom I know personally will never give a quote because they have a, no quote policy. It just makes you, again, I think we're all coming back to, do your homework. Like if you're expecting us to take you seriously, then you need to take us seriously and, and, and value our time. I think going along with that is just always to be reading because you read the books, you love it, you look at the acknowledgments, you see who's you know edited them and worked with them as an agent, and knowing what's out there and what's working in the category that you want to be publishing in, I think is also really important um, not to know those great books that are working in that category. I think going to talk to your editor, to your agent, it shows that you haven't done your homework, and I think always be reading, buying books from experience. And, and just and uh -huh. karmically, okay, can we just agree that karmically, if you want some random person in Nebraska three years from now to go into their local bookstore and buy your book, somebody they've never heard of, you know, and they have no connection to, and you're not in your own bookstore at least once a month buying a book by someone you've never heard of, but that looks interesting, and putting it back, like, people, come on. I mean, we talk about the industry and, and how it's, you know, book sales are down and it's hard to make it and people are like, well, why is it so tough? It's so tough because people aren't buying books. So if you want to be a part of this community and you want other people to buy your books, you kind of owe it to yourself and everybody else to be part of that community and to be supporting it. <laughs> I'll take the positive uh, okay. piece of this answer and everybody else can follow up. Um, I think there, there are some really great things about the internet. We can reach people in all sorts of new ways. There's a democratization of reviewers. Uh, we had a wonderful party at Penguin last night for book bloggers. Uh, there are a whole lot more voices than we ever would have heard from before. There are 
obviously some major structural challenges uh, with that democratization, but one of the great things that I always think about ebooks is there are people who are reading more because of ebooks. Devices like the Kindle, the iPad, uh, the Sony Reader, they are they are bringing books to, and more books to people than than would have otherwise seen them. The challenge for us is we are not built to function on that price model, and that's a, a larger business question than we could be here all night discussing. But I think what we have to do is do what we do better. We have to publish, we have to drill down and find the writers that we truly believe in and that we love and we have a passion for and take them out into the world with as much energy as we can and hope that people will avail themselves of all formats to, to enjoy that novel or to enjoy that work of nonfiction. So yes, it is challenging. It has shaken our industry quite a bit, but there is a whole lot positive to be gained from it. And I hope that writers feel the same way because it's a great opportunity for them too. There's, there's nothing wrong with selling eBooks. Like I, I, don't, I don't care how you buy your book. I just want you to buy a book. So you know, if you prefer to read it on an electronic device, but you're still supporting writers, great. Um, the, the, I think the hardest thing about, about eBooks is what it does to small independent bookstores who can't compete. So um, the answer to that is, once again, for you to go out and support them as readers and as book buyers. But I agree with Ginny, it's not, I don't think it's destroying the business, it's just changing it. Um, you can actually buy a lot of eBooks a lot of independent booksellers will sell ebooks through their website, so you can also sort of go check them out and really support them that way, too. Sorry. Um, two questions that are both under the same question, which is, when do you give up? And so, <laughs> part of that is, when you have an agent you're just certain is going to love your book, but you don't hear back, do you, how much can you bug the agent before giving up? And then, for the authors, when did you guys give up on past novels that didn't sell? How many agents did you query? When did you realize? Well, let me start off about giving up on past novels. That, you know, um, I think that I, 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 with perhaps one exception, never actually decided that I was giving up on this particular novel and moving on. Um, I just was continuing to write, and when I finished one, I was starting another, and so that's how the process went. I never said, that one's going to go in the drawer, and now I'll start this one. Um, well, that's not entirely true, but um, <laughs> uh, one in that case, uh, when I had gone through a year of trying to get it, so you know, I had an agent who was pushing, pushing it, sending it to all the right places, and it just wasn't happening. I put it aside. I'm still, I still think about it. I still think about some of the earlier ones. But as Anne was saying earlier, I now look at some of the earlier ones and see what the problem was. Uh, and that's just out of, you know, after experience of writing and writing and writing and writing. So as far as actually giving up on a book and moving on to the next one, um, I don't think you necessarily have to, um, ever. You can always take pieces of something and cannibalize it, use it again, or, or go back to that idea you know, five years from now. Or In fact, this book, I actually started, started off um, and got to about page 100, and um, it wasn't working. And I just dropped it for a while, and I started working on something else. And then I decided, well, maybe that's not working so well either. And I went back to it, and I don't know why, in the period of a year or so in between, I looked at this again and said, wow, you know, I kind of like this again. So sometimes it's just a matter of perspective. So I, I don't think you ever ne necessarily need to give up. Uh, how often do you need to, uh, uh, can you bother agents uh, after you've sent your, I'll, I'll let them answer that actually. Once. You can follow up with me once. But, you know, I. You, you, it's interesting because the way you phrased the question was like, you have this agent that you know, like, you don't know. And that person might not even be the right person for you. Like, there could be some really amazing agent out there that you've never heard of who is going to be like your hero. And you just haven't heard of them or never met them. But, you know, it's like you can, you know, we, we're buried and we're not as good at getting back to people as quickly as we can. So you can certainly follow up, I would say, email is best. 
rather than calling. You know, just wanted to make sure you got my query or just checking in to see if you had a chance to look at it or just following up, and that's it. And then let it go. But you should really be submitting your query to 40 agents at a time because you have absolutely no idea who's going to respond to it. And then in the best case scenario, a bunch of them do. And then you get to really find out how they see your book and how they would pitch your book and who's the best fit for you. starts creating in my head and this happens only uh, like every seven years or something like that so but um, I think the way to stay sane as a writer through the sending it out process is to be moving on to something else at the same time because it can take months and months and months and if you're just sitting there obsessively staring at your email screen you're gonna drive yourself insane and it also just lets you keep growing and keep writing and doing the thing that makes you you so it's like the best tool okay, I think we'll do one more question I just wanted to know what the impact of self-publishing has been. Self-publishing, like Lulu.com and some of the other self-publishing. The question is what the impact of self-publishing has been, and I, I, I don't really know the answer. I mean, I think that it gives writers an opportunity, certainly, to put who haven't been able to find an agent or haven't been able to find a publisher to put their work out into the world. Um, I think it's hard. I mean, I think there's a lot of talk about, you know, why do we need publishers? Why should, why can't we just, you really do need a publisher. I mean, a publisher does an immense amount of work that you, you don't even know they're doing. And some of that is the jacket and how that looks. And some of it is, you know, marketing budgets. But a lot of that is through all these sort of background things that you don't even know about distribution getting the book into stores you know making sure that it's that it's printed nicely and, and well and copy edited um, so I think that's that self-publishing is an option and certainly the right one for certain people but I don't know that it's made a huge change on the industry except in the case of those self-published books that manage to and usually it's a fluke um, attract a huge audience, and then usually, uh, um, you know, a big publisher comes along and buys the rights and republishes it. I think it's really hard to get to get noticed as being self-published. You have to be really, really hustling. I mean, I think all all writers, even published by publishers, are hustling too. But um, you know, as Julie said, it is a fluke to be successful that way. You can get lost in the vast online world of other self-published books and um, I think to have somebody really like be pushing your book and as Julie said there are so many people at a publishing company that touch a book at any one time Bit like 50 80 people will be working on a book at various points um, and I think just having that can really word of mouth get your book out too um, so I think it's there are challenges to self-publishing but again there have been successes too Okay, well thank you so much for coming and